Our next scientist tonight is Priya Natarajan. She's a professor in the departments of astronomy and physics at Yale, who turned me down twice. Um, she holds the Sophie and Tycho Brahe professorship at the Dark Center at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, Denmark. I want to work at the Dark Center. I feel like you must talk in hushed voices with English accents and wear like caftans. Um, her research is focused on exotica in the universe. It's not what you think. It's dark matter, dark energy, and black holes. She is noted for her key contributions to two of the most challenging problems in cosmology, mapping the distribution of dark matter and tracing the growth history of black holes Oh, P.S., she's also a published poet. Please help me welcome Priya to the stage. So um, how we choose to do what we end up doing is, of course, deeply personal, and what I want to do today is to give you a sense of how I got to be doing what I'm doing. Um, Why growing up, I wanted to be an explorer. And the reason I wanted to be an explorer is because I was fascinated with maps. And of course, I was adventurous. However, I was an adventurer of the armchair variety, I discovered. I really did not want to go on long, grueling voyages. And uh, since I, I'm vain and I love my teeth, I didn't want to get scurvy either. So I became a cosmologist. Um, I have always been fascinated by maps. And um, what I want to show you today is how our view of the universe started much closer in by understanding and mapping terra firma, just our local neighborhood. So, um, so we've had explorers who braved and conquerors who did not know whether the Earth would end. So you had Alexander the Great or Marco Polo who just set off on these voyages bravely not even knowing where they were heading off to. Of course, as time went on, we had some very successful journeys, and we had a wonderful view of what our world looked like. So this is a map from a German-Dutch map from the 1820s. And this shows in the projection, and I want you to pay attention to the projection, where this, this suggests already that we had our sense of who we are and where we are was fairly sophisticated by this time. We knew that the Earth was not flat, hence this projection. And we also knew that there was a reference frame of fixed stars that would anchor us at sea when uh, we went out to navigate. And we also knew by this time that, of course, the Earth revolves around the sun. And these, all these ideas put together fundamentally transformed our sense of place on Earth. And of course, simultaneous with this, we also wanted to look at the night sky and start using the night sky to guide us and to start making more and more accurate maps of the night sky. Before we move on to the night sky, I wanted to show you how we also learned how to do other projections. So this is a flat projection of the world as we know it. And this is a map, again, a German-Dutch map from the 1890s, late 1890s. And at this time, what became very clear is in order to navigate the world, to explore further, we needed to have accurate star maps. So maps of the sky that gave you an accurate view of the fixed stars, that was basically our compass. And guess who made the first calculations, the detailed calculations, uh, of the star maps. It turns out that in the 19, 1880s to 1930s, it was women. A very, very talented set of elite educated women at the Harvard College Observatory were the star map makers. So you can see them there, all standing there in holding hands. And as you can see, we've come a long way, right? I'm wearing a much more comfortable skirt <laughs> than they are. 
And you know, jokes aside, um, we have come a long way, but in fields like mine, um, theoretical cosmology, um, it's still not clear that there is a sense that women can be and are as adept at doing these abstract mathematical calculations and what it takes to really make original contributions. But we have come a long way because for these women, the reason these women were doing these calculations because at that time they were viewed as very tedious calculations, calculations that didn't require much creativity. However, they made the most amazing Ac amazingly accurate star maps, which are still used to calibrate the current telescopes. Oh, she should go back. I want to go back. I forgot to mention that what you see on the top panel there is our view of the night sky, of the southern sky and the northern sky, with the white swathe, which is the stars that constitute our galaxy, the Milky Way, spread out across. So the calculations done by these women enabled us to accurately map the precise shape of the white swath of the Milky Way that you see there. So where are we now? And how well do we know our cosmic address now? So it turns out that we have now reached the farthest bits of the universe that we possibly can in terms of mapping. So what people like me um, have been doing for the past decade or so is to try and reconstruct using the path of light beams in the universe to look at what lies between us and the distant galaxies that are shedding light. So what you see here is a schematic of light beams from distant galaxies en route to us. And in the inset, once again, remember the flat projection that we saw of the Earth. Similarly, what we see is a flat projection of the sky. And what we see, the way the light beams are traversing through the universe on their long journey, the presence of this black fuzzy stuff that you see there deflects them, deforms them. They are no longer traveling in straight lines. You may wonder what is really going on here. So this, of course, you know, and you may also wonder, well, you know, there is no science talk where you cannot worship Einstein, right? I mean, is there anyone who thinks he, you know, he had a bad hair day, so let's not talk about him today? No. <laughs> it turns out one of the most profound things that Einstein came up with was the realization that the geometry, the contents, and the fate of the universe are intricately linked. And he figured that out by understanding how light travels in the universe. So light is bent, it travels on space-time, and it is bent by the presence of any stuff, any matter that you have along the line of sight to us. So the path of light rays contain information about everything that they have encountered on the way to us. So what we can do now, looking at patches of the night sky, looking at the distortions in the light, which have been produced due to the presence of this stuff, we can reconstruct the rays of light back from the source that they came from. And as a consequence, we can map everything that lies between us and the distant galaxies. So it turns out some of these light beams are so dramatically modified, torn apart, deformed, that if you look at the right panel in the top there, so you have a rather innocuous looking, this is not a looker of a galaxy, this is not an Angelina Jolie, this is like a random average Joe galaxy. And the presence of dark matter in this intervening galaxy that lies between us and this very distant blue blob causes the shape of that original shape to be deformed into that huge, almost full ring. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy whose shape has been extremely distorted. So the light rays coming from that little blob have been highly distorted. And instead of seeing its original shape, you see this very, very bent shape. And before you think that, ah, this must be, you know, the universe is full of oddities. You know, there are people who have six fingers on their right hand, so maybe this is a one-off thing. Actually, it isn't. 
It turns out because there is so much dark matter in the universe that this phenomenon is ubiquitous. What you see here are two other um, images of highly distorted galaxies, one of which has been strung out into almost a full ring, and that is, of course, called an Einstein ring. And another one there where you see another very, very um, arky shape of a very simple blob. So what is this dark matter? So it turns out that most of the matter in the universe is dark matter, and it is termed as such, well, partly when cosmologists don't understand something, they append dark to it, okay? So there's the first, <laughs> that's the first thing. The second thing, we truly do not know what its nature is. And people like me have been trying to understand the distribution of dark matter in the universe to see if there's any clue that we can get to what it is actually made of. So it turns out that 90% of all the matter in the universe is dark matter. And the stuff that we are made of, the ordinary atoms, just 4%. We're a piddly 4%. Okay, everything else is this dark matter. And the only thing we do know about dark matter is that it has gravity. So it can bend light. That's what we know. You know, and there are all these very expensive and fantastic experiments that are underway both in the laboratory and at the particle accelerator at CERN to try and figure out when in the early universe whatever this dark matter might be formed, right? And no news yet, but we're all very hopeful. You know, my personal theory is that every time I do my laundry, I, I'm missing socks. So I think that you know, it must be unmatched socks. You know, everybody has their unmatched socks, and I think you know, dark matter could well be that. Except somehow, it's been hard to get a journal paper accepted with, you know, <laughs> with that thesis. So let's look at a few examples of extreme light bending. So this phenomenon, by the way, the technical term, if you want to impress someone, is called gravitational lensing. So what you see here is a very, very um, extremely bent galaxy. You can see it as an arc, like a little smiley face, slightly scowly slash smiley face because it's sort of uh, you know, uh, off to the side. And, and this is a region, there's another region of the universe where you see, close up, you can see a whole bunch of other distorted arcs. There you can see a close up of an arc which is very, very highly bent. And you may say, well, this is all very nice, but I'm just seeing light here, so what's dark about it? So what do you actually do? <laughs> so it turns out, so this is another region of the sky, and I want you to focus on the region that is inside this yellow circle. And this is a circle that I put in PowerPoint myself. So this, this is not what the Hubble Space Telescope saw. So what you see, and we'll just zoom in now into that region. And what you see here, if you look very carefully at the rim of the yellow circle, you will see five images of the same background galaxy. So the one trick thing that I didn't tell you, which probably all of you know from your physics classes, that the little nuance is always left out to the end, right? So the light bending can sometimes be so extreme that you end up seeing many, many images of the same object. Okay, so here you are seeing five images of the same background galaxy. So if you follow your eye right around the yellow rim of the circle, you will see five images. So what we then do is we calculate, starting from a prior distribution of blob shapes and looking at the final distorted arcs, what the dark matter distribution ought to look like. So on the right panel there, I've shown you a reconstruction of the dark matter distribution in this patch of the sky. What you see as the blue background is a uniform distribution of dark matter, on top of which you see a lot of little clumps and the clumps are shown as peaks. And notice, you see a lot of peaks in the region that is circled in yellow. So notice that where you see those peaks, uh -huh, you do see some light, right? So there are these galaxies on the left-hand side that kind of correlate, which is very interesting. So it turns out that by and large in the universe, light and mass trace each other. So wherever you see galaxies, you do have dark matter. And it turns out that the relationship is more intricate than that. The dark matter actually forms the scaffolding on which galaxies actually form. So let me show you in the final slide a visualization. So this is a patch of sky that has a lot of extreme gravitational lensing. So all these 
many images of the same object, many distorted arcs. There's a whole plethora of stuff on, so this is what we end up seeing. So again, a Hubble Space Telescope image. And what you see in the right panel in the blue fuzz is the reconstruction of the dark matter distribution in the same patch of sky. There are shades of blue there that correlate to how much, how clumpy it is. It's not as obvious in the slide. But as you can see, there's a lot of dark matter in the cluster. So this is called the cluster of galaxies. And you have dark matter concentrated, very, very concentrated. So this is just another flat projection of the peaks that I just showed you. So we find that dark matter clearly is everywhere. And the little prince was actually right, after all. The essential is always invisible to the eye. So I want to conclude by just saying that so this is the new era of exploration. And if someone asks me, so after the current voyages of cosmologists, what maps do you have to show? These are the maps we have to show. Thank you very much, and I look forward to speaking to you.